Hello, welcome. Let's go for a farm walk. And this farm represents where farming currently is. So these fields here, with the buildings in the middle, which is where we are now, are typical of farmsteads, tens of thousands of small farms across the UK. This farm's just a little bit over 100 acres, and it was until quite recently farming a range of uh, barley, continuous barley, and grassland. That was, that's pretty much it. So quite a simplified farming system. So the farming system now is constructed of a complex eight-year rotation. And this eight-year rotation is deliberately designed to improve the soil's fertility. And that's where we start with our farming system here. It's all about the soil. So let's go and see some soil to start with. So for me, everything starts with the soil. Everything we do here at this farm is driven by improving the quality of the soil because that is our biggest asset. And what this is here is a piece of soil, a one hectare, two and a half acres. That's the equivalent of two and a half football pitches, which we have kept exactly as has been farmed here for the last um, two to three decades. And what this is, this is soil. This is the stuff, of course, we're growing our food in. This is soil that has had the same management for a very long period of time. And what's interesting is that it doesn't really smell of much and it, it just all crumbles apart. There isn't any earthworms in it. And this is what's happening on a, l a large part of our countryside. My, my concern is that with this continuous arable cropping, we're depleting a lot of the organic matter in the soil. And that's the carbon that is, it's, it's still around the planet, but it's in atmospheric form. So it's carbon dioxide, as opposed to carbon that's locked up in the soil. And what we need to do is find a way to get it back in. Partly for climate change, in other words, cooling the planet, but also because if we've got loads more organic matter in our soils, that is the best way for us to grow crops. And those crops with more organic matter in the soil will be more nutritionally dense, and they won't need as many pesticides, if any, or herbicides, or, or fertilizers. And it's really, really important that we get this right. So this is our crop, which has had a herbicide treatment called glyphosate. It's had a seed treatment which protects the initial seedlings when they're growing. We are growing a crop in it. This crop we've sown is winter wheat and this represents on this two and a half acres, one hectare, about the size of just over two football pitches, represents what most farmers in the UK have been doing. And we farmers have been growing uh, lots of monocultures in recent years to increase the yield of corn. We've increased the yield significantly in my lifetime. The world's population has doubled and yet the land area hasn't. We have managed to grow twice as much corn effectively on the same land area to increase the, to support an increasing population. And on the one hand, that's an amazing feat with the green revolution as it's known, which is a mixture of plant breeding, which I'm very familiar with, uh, and a combination with pesticides and fertilizers. And those, two th those three things together have effectively revolutionized what we do on the same area of land. So on the one hand, it's been successful, but on the other hand, just, you know, just look at these soils. They're, they're missing that organic matter. That organic matter now in, is in the atmosphere. A lot of the carbon has been released from these arable soils into the atmosphere. And it's our job now to reconsider what we're doing and to figure out how we put it back into the soil. And this winter wheat crop will grow ideally a crop of bread, although many wheats in this country are not used for bread making, they end up in the animal feed trade. But for me, what's really important is that any crops we grow on the land, where possible, should be used for human consumption. And the idea of growing a crop like this, for example, to 
uh, to feed uh, you know beef for example in America they in North America they something like 95 percent of the beef is fed on uh, corn or, or, or grains of some description in the UK uh, it's nothing like that but it's a, d a slippery slope and it's a dangerous uh, thing for us to go down that road when our ruminant animals our cattle and our sheep can eat perfectly well off uh, pastures and, and grassland in our arable rotations. And that's what I'm going to talk about now today, is how we do that through a different farming system that evolves around crop rotation. Crop rotation that actually produces lots of diverse food, but also locks carbon into the, atmosphere, into the soils. And in addition to that, we'll work alongside wildlife so we can improve, not deplete, biodiversity the really important things. But just to start with the economics. Of course, if you're a farmer and you're making your living from farming, you have to have crops to sell and it has to be economic to, uh, to, to you. So the question is, you know, is this system viable? Well, for an increasing number of us, it isn't. And back in the day when I was younger, farmers were making money. We were paid quite well, but now, um, the price of our outputs hasn't gone up and although we've produced more yield it seems to me like it's a bit of a race to the bottom. This field is a good example which makes no money. Um, it'll grow a perfectly good crop of wheat but the cost of the inputs, the synthesized man-made products that we put on here, fertilizer and pesticides, means that there is no margin left for us at the end of the day. Occasionally in good years we might make money, but very often, particularly on these typically marginal soils here in the Cotswolds in the middle of England, there is no profit left. So, how do we fix that? And that's the question that we're going to address next. So how then can we lock in more carbon into the soil, make a more viable farming system for the farmer and produce diverse food that we can eat in this region? Well, this I think is the answer. So what I'm showing you here is a herbal lay. Now, I could have also described it as a multi-species sward, which I suppose is its correct technical term. But basically what this is, is a field or part of a crop rotation that is growing a diverse mix of plants. And what's important to note is that this is a prerequisite, it is a thing that you need to do if you're going to build soil fertility in the soil and lock in that carbon. Now, of course in isolation, this crop we can't eat. Us humans, of course, can't eat grasses and herbs and clovers. But this stuff is gold because this is the stuff that we're growing our food in and there is the organic matter. Now this is completely different. So you can hear that ripping apart. Just look at this. See, here's, here, I've broken the roots off, but this is a deep rooting plant which penetrates through the soil. And just look how this is all held together with loads of diverse roots. And these diverse roots, of course, in all their different shapes and forms, is carbon. And if we grow this type of mixture in this soil, the carbon, oh, that just smells so nice. This, this, is, this is what we should be growing our food in. But we need to have this in a system that is efficient and fully utilized. So what we're doing on this farm is to grow four years of these deep rooting plants. They grow 24 seven throughout the year without the need for fertilizers or pesticides. We then can utilize them with our livestock, which come and graze them. So in the case of a sheep farmer, you can graze your sheep on it. You can have beef production from this. And of course, you can have dairy production from this. And the animals on here are incredibly healthy because they don't 
you know, they, animals don't just want one plant, they just don't want a grass, they want lots of things. Um, and unless we want to feed them with imported soy from South America, for example, to get protein, well, why can't we do that in the UK from clover? That's rich with protein. There is no need for us to be importing uh, soy to finish animals, to fatten animals. So to me, this is where the solution lies. These highly nutritious plants that the animals eat will then of course end up incre increasing the capacity of, our, of the soil to feed us. When that's happened, then we can grow our wheat. And our wheat that grows after this, and I'll show you now, doesn't need much fertilizer, if any, doesn't need any pesticides because there's no weeds. Many farmers struggle with black grass and weeds that are really causing them problems. But when you've grown this and grazed it with animals, many of those weeds just disappear. So the next crop after this, this deep rooting mixture, is our wheat. And that's our carbon neutral wheat. Let's go and see it. So once we've grown our four-year lay fertility building crop that the animals have been over and eaten, and remember that it's not just the animals that have been on here for four years, we haven't put a tractor on this ground for four years, we will put on no fertilizers, no pesticides. So guess what happens in here? There's pollination all over the place with, with uh, you know, bees and wasps and hoverflies and you name it, they're all coming into here. There are mammals, you know, the hares and all sorts of uh, creatures come across this ground, the deer like it. Um, none of them graze too much, it really isn't a problem from a farming point of view. But it's just alive with birds nesting, you know, ground nesting birds are in this. It's, a, it's surprising, astonishingly good. Uh, very often, I mean, we've just the last few weeks had a lot of goldfinches here. Three or four hundred goldfinches have been just browsing over the seed heads that we've left on these lays. So whether it's flowering, whether it's seeding, whether it's being grazed, there's always biodiversity going on in our fields, not just on the margins. We've, on this farm we have loads of margins with, with wildflowers and uh, trees that we planted uh, around, but, and, and they're really important habitats. But we can also have habitat in the field. So rather than just tinkering on the margins, which are important, we're actually delivering much more by in, in incorporating diversity into the fields. Here's our wheat that we've sown after our lay, after our grass lay, after our fertility building lay. This wheat has been sown for a few weeks and will continue to grow all the way through the, 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 the late autumn into the winter and then come the spring it'll grow and it'll blossom and it'll be just amazing. It will be waving in the wind with a, in this case, a highly diverse mixture of wheats. So we're growing a mixture of wheats which are under sown with a crop of clover. So there's more clover fixing uh, nitrogen into the ground and the clover suppresses the weeds. So we've got this two crops in one, a bicrop. So when the wheat is eventually harvested, we hope the wheat will uh, be really suitable for human consumption and we will mill it and eat it in the local area. We'll encourage other people to do that, hopefully. And then underneath there is clover. And the clover is not just great for the soil, but also our animals can then come across and graze that clover. So again, very little requirement for anything synthesized off the farm. We're completely self-sufficient with our farming system here. This to me is a way forward. It's a way of farming that's been practiced for probably around nine and a half to 10,000 years. And it's only in the last 50 to 60 years that we've intensified and depended totally on synthetically made products to push on our dwarf wheats. And most farms in, uh, in the UK and around the world are using uh, wheats that have been dwarfed and all the genes uh, have been selected to create a short straw with a very heavy grain on the top and that has been successful in terms of yield but in order to do that we've had to put on a lot of fertilizers and pesticides. So the question is now whether we can rekindle, reintroduce a lot of the old genes from the old types of wheats, the ancient wheats and find modern ways to use these because we know they've got great root systems. They're much more resilient to climate change. We know that they'll have much more straw to add the carbon back into the soils. We know that if farmers were paid enough, they would grow them. Now there may be a little bit of yield loss because we aren't filling them full of fertilizers. And there's an issue for us all to deal with. Do we want though to continue to deplete our soil with a, what is becoming clearly a less sustainable farming system, 
or do we want to build a new system with good technical knowledge around very old traditional wheats in this case. And I put it to you that we need to develop our ideas on, on how we grow these because if we get this right, this could be nutritionally dense food that humans eat, not for animal feed, but for humans to eat directly. It'd be great for farmers, but we do need to pay them well. The price of wheat in line with the yield increases, the price of wheat's fallen. So farmers have on the one hand produced a lot more for the same amount of money, but their costs have gone up massively and they can't continue to do that because it is not going to succeed. We have to find new ways of thinking about this and this is one of those. So my guess is we might produce a little bit less wheat in this case, but providing our farmers are paid well to do it, they will deliver all the carbon capture, they will deliver all the biodiversity, but we have to encourage them to do it. So as an eater, you and I need to find ways of doing it. And I think the first thing to do is to understand how this farming system can work. And that means talking to each other, coming to the farms, seeing what's going on, understanding how you can support this change to what I think will become known as the regenerative farming system that sweeps across the country. There are already thousands of farmers just like this looking for alternatives and developing alternative uh, products, highly diverse products and new ways to market. The pandemic for example has given many farmers the opportunity to deal directly with the end user. Now from small beginnings, you know, from little acorns come massive oak trees and that's what's happening in the countryside. Get engaged, it's so exciting. So looking at this mass of clover now, it's amazing to think that this little, these little plants that have become quite big, you know, like plates, are, 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 were underneath all this wheat. And the wheat, of course, has been harvested and has left this mass of green material, which is just such a great fertility builder. It keeps the, keeps the soil covered, it keeps the moisture in, uh, great for pollinators, of course, when it flowers. And it's, of course, it's grazed with our livestock. So it's win, 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 I think, <laughs> is the term that we'd use for this. So we talk about integrating our wildlife, if you like, into the, into the farming. Well, this is a really nice example of it. So farmers um, are encouraged to, through the, through the support scheme, to plant uh, seed mixtures which uh, bear f seeds for farmland birds. And what we've done here is we've put this into part of our crop rotation in year eight, which is a, 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 a nice place to have a really highly diverse mixture of seed bearing plants. And these seed bearing plants will provide birds with seed in the winter. And you can see these sunflower seeds here, for example, are going to be available for birds uh, in, a, in, the, in the next month or two. These are all seeds and really, really useful to, to help birds survive through the winter. Because in many modern farming systems with monoculture, there is no seed being returned to the ground. And with herbicides you know, being used on very wide scales, there's no seed for seed eating birds. So come the winter time, many of them literally starve when they've cleared up the seed. So many farmers have been, for many years now, been putting down uh, bird seed mixes. What we've got here is a range of 50 different species. And the 50 different species are all doing something quite different. And I'm interested in not only providing seed, of course, for birds, which is a wonderful thing to do, but also in improving soils. So bearing in mind that our farm here is, de is designed to increase the, uh, the soil's capacity. So we're growing deep rooting plants along with shallow rooting plants, with nitrogen fixing plants. Uh, and as you can see, this, this soil is completely full of photosynthetic plants. And that's what gives us this soil building and bird seed. So it's a bird seed mix, a soil building mix. And then in the spring, when all these plants have senesced and died back, or most of them, we've got plants that will be growing really early in the spring. And then our sheep come on and graze them. And that means that the sheep are grazing this piece and not those lovely herbal lays, which are only just beginning to get going in March and April. Here, what we're, talking, what we're doing is we're protecting those by utilizing this. Now, this is gonna be plowed in anyway for the next crop. So the sheep to go over it as a, instead of a herbicide, a herbivore will of course remove all this lovely foliage. And it's just such a nice system. Happy days. So 
So in year seven of our rotation, we're growing a cereal, spring cereal, which gives us grains, of course, in the summer. And then we follow it with a crop of rye and vetch. And this crop is grown specifically to improve the soil, keep the soil covered over the winter, and also to provide grazing in the early spring. So the big advantage of this crop, and it's been used for years and years by many, many farmers, is that it grows very early in the spring, which means that, again, it protects our, our uh, species-rich herbal lays from being overgrazed too early in the year. So our animals come on to graze this, this fertility building crop, which is, which is full of um, loads of leaf matter in the spring, and that in April is used, then it's ploughed in and uh, grows its next crop. So it's a, this is a catch crop between the cereal and the next crop, so it's effectively a cover crop. Of course the key thing about having loads of food produced on our farms is diversity and one of the areas that I think is most interesting is the diversity that you can get if you change the climate and in this case here having polytunnels to grow food in is a real boon for, uh, for farms like this. So this is a small area of production, two acres or so, just under a hectare and is run by three part-time people known as the kitchen garden people and they are such an asset on a farm like this because they grow a wider range of produce than we can grow on the arable ground and they grow food for uh, 100 local families in this area. I think the Community Supported Agriculture Scheme, a CSA as it's known, is, a, is in a way a rotten name because it really shouldn't need any support at all. This is a brilliant way of producing food uh, which involves the local community who support it with their money and they pledge and put money in advance for the growers to grow without any risk. It's just such a brilliantly simple scheme. And um, I would like to think there'll be thousands of these schemes around the countryside as time goes on. We've already seen quite a number of them springing up in this district and um, it would be great to see many, many more because they're all very local, very uh, sustainable and um, are a brilliant addition to farms. They just bring life onto the farm. So there's probably, I'm not exactly sure how many different species are grown here, but I'm told reliably that, you know, perhaps 35 to 40 species can be grown in the UK, particularly with the addition of uh, polytunnels or glass houses. So this is, for me, a really exciting area of work going forwards into the future that would add so much to uh, all, you know, simple mon monoculture systems. So watch this space. young hedge here is uh, triple planted and we will allow it to grow to about 12 feet tall roughly about four meters and then we'll lay the hedge over and the rest of the woodland we'll just let go and this is a deciduous woodland which as you can see is very young but growing quite well at the moment and come in years to come this will you know mature and will prevent uh, provide a lovely warm side on, 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 on the farm side where crops will grow better, where there'll be break, uh, you know, wind break for livestock and, and everything will be warmer. So um, it's a really important habitat. And what's interesting to me is that the whole bird population on this farm has exploded. When we came here, we record every month, when we came here, there was 44 species resident or visiting the farm. And now we're up to 86 species. Uh, we're just by changing the, the diversity in the cropping and the diversity on the land. So, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's a, again a win-win situation. The more you have going on, the more you can integrate live, uh, wildlife into the farming system. And those bird numbers, you know, where you double the bird numbers are just a, such a simple illustration of what happens when you bring diversity onto the farm. There's loads of interesting things on this farm. Around pretty much every corner you go, you come across something that's different. And here is a really nice example. These are um, natural beehives. So uh, unlike the conventional beehive, the apiary that we have on the farm, uh, this is a, um, a piece of uh, experimental work which is looking at how bees would naturally live within um, a, uh, you know, a, a, a hollowed out tree. Because of course bees don't live in hives, they live in trees. And um, many of us have been clearing up trees thinking that it's better to be tidy and not allowing uh, nature to exist in what would otherwise be you know, fallen trees, dead wood. So it's really interesting to, um, to see what happens here. And we've already got a, a colony of bees uh, living in, the, uh, in this tree hive, and um, we shall see what happens in the future. But it's a very interesting experiment.
so um, these trees are amazing, aren't they? The, the fruit that they provide, especially set against this beautiful sky. But I think what's interesting to note here particularly is not just the fruit, but also the, the solar panels, the PV, the, the, the electricity we're generating on this site now. Um, the water that we're harvesting, so the water that runs off this roof is being collected uh, into large tanks and is eventually going into our flood management scheme. And it's just really lovely to sort of work with nature, uh, to work with the seasons, to work with the elements and to harness, you know, this free power sun. And, you know, to me it's like sort of, you know, just a gift really. And um, with a small investment that we've made here to capture it, we're now powering most of the uh, work that we do in the buildings. And the water is really important too because it's one of the limiting factors on the farm and not only that but if it runs off the farm too quickly of course it's going to flood the valley which is um, which is a really big problem potentially uh, especially with climate change so um, yeah lots of work to that has been done and a lot more to do This is a really interesting part of the farm. It's, it's like another world really to the rest of the farm. So on the farm where we're, we're growing food, this is really a piece of farm that we can't use for food production. So many farms have got these areas where, you know, it's actually either very wet, as you can see, I'm actually stood at the head of a spring here. And um, this water is flowing quite nicely and it flows for, you know, 11 months of the year. And it's only in extreme drought that it stops. But what's interesting about this water is as are many, many farms across the last few, uh, well, probably the last hundred years or so since Victorian times, we've been putting in drains to get water off farms because um, it's really difficult to grow crops if you're stood in water like this. So of course, it can't be done. So many farms had directed uh, in straight lines uh, water off the farms to, 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 to dry the ground up. And on this particular farm we've got ridge and furrow grassland which is the uh, undulations that were made a couple of hundred years ago to grow crops in to hold water um, and to define areas where people could grow. This has become defunct, the drains that were put in, old Victorian plain drains don't work here anymore and the water was running straight off the farm in a straight line to the river. And to me water is one of the most beautiful things that we could have on a farm. So we decided that we would um, recreate the, where the water would have flown originally uh, or flowed originally where we, where, before we came to the farm. And so we took advice from our local friends in the district who knew these, these waterways very well and in a very short amount of time we figured out that we'd actually be able to, uh, w with a bit of intervention, recreate what was here many years ago. So with two men and one digger and one dumper truck and one week and £7,000, we created a natural flood management scheme. We were so grateful for the help that we got from local people who knew how to do this. And also, there was a small lottery grant that came available, uh, National Lottery Funds for All, which was enabled us to do this work. So the water now, instead of just going straight down the ditch and the hedgerow, now comes out and goes down an old river valley, which you can see the contours of which are still very clear to see. And what we've done is we've dug a series of ponds with attenuation dams and the idea is that these ponds hold the water and as the water builds up in the pond as it rains a lot it eventually seeps through the back of the pond through a dam and goes to the next pond and the next pond and the next pond and there are four ponds here with little snaking channels in between them so the water is just held up on the farm and you can see it in action and we've had all sorts of people visit this uh, over the years from policymakers to uh, water authorities to uh, people interested in the environment to politicians and, 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 and everyone. And what's interesting is that of course in isolation this wouldn't work because it's too small. But what's been happening all through this wonderful valley is that many farms are now creating very similar schemes to this and there is money available for them to do it because it's so much easier to hold water up on the farm here than it is to solve problems further downstream in the cities where of course flooding is a massive issue. This is a much cheaper way of doing it and it's so beneficial to have water on the farms. After all, to grow crops we need lots of water. So why let it run straight off the farms and flood further downstream? So one of the things, it's a really simple thing for me that was so beneficial was within a, a, a day or so, you know, we have a dog, the dog was 
swimming in the ponds that were filling up. The ducks came. Two days after we dug it, the snipe came. You know, the whole place has been alive. We've had frogs, we've had dragonflies, uh, heron, you know, everything that you could think of that depends on water, muddy, muddy areas. It's all come here. And this was an area of the farm that was not used. The livestock tended not to go in it. It's not nice to stand on wet ground. Um, so they weren't using it in, in former times. We've put a fence around to protect it so that um, it is allowed to grow. And very occasionally we might run some sheep over it to, to clear some scrub. But fundamentally, this is not farmed land. This is land that supports the farming. And more importantly, the, the creatures that live on this, you know, integrate into the rest of the farm. So there's lots of things here. So the bees in, in the apiary on this farm, they're off, they flood down here, literally, to get the water. It's very, very important that they have surface water available if they're to function. So here's the water running down through this attenuation dam. So here is the, the stones that we put in to make this dam after the first pond. And you can see how it's flowing through. It's like a, this is literally like a sieve. And of course it's holding the, 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 the silt back and it's, it's just, you know, filtering the water, slowing it down. And it's beautiful. It's just so fresh and lovely, you know. Oh, <laughs> oh so nice. So this is, this is now flowing down to the next pond. The next pond, as you can see, is just ahead of us, and that's been cleared out with uh, a digger this, this autumn. This, this has been here since 2015, and initially we'd expect, of course, a lot of the, the, the earth that we move will fall back in, and we filled up that pond in um, to 75% capacity within the four years or so uh, that it was dug. And it's only a little pond, but we took the silt out, we put it on our compost heap, we're mixing it in to spread it back on the land that it came from. So there's a little bit of management required, but really not very much. It's very low key. And if you get it right, you, you would hardly know we'd been there. We haven't cleaned out all the ponds. We've only just cleaned that one out because we know that one has silted up first. Now, if we cleaned everything out, we'd lose a lot of wildlife, which we don't want to do. So we clean them out just every now and again to keep them functioning so there's a bit of depth to them. But isn't this lovely? I just love it. This is, this is the sort of thing that we want to see on farms. You know, I, I don't want to see this going down a ditch particularly. I think it's such a nice natural feature to have on the farm. Everybody loves it. So here we are at the bottom of the natural flood management area that we've created. And what's important is that we have a lot of trees that have been planted here at the same time as the natural flood management uh, ponds. And the trees are really important because of their root structures. And the more trees that we've got in a densely populated packed area, the more roots we have, the more uh, infiltration we get of the water that uh, eventually gets down to the bottom of the farm. And the biggest uh, area, the biggest um, scrape and pond is here. And this is, again, an area of the farm that really wasn't used by any uh, animals. It was just wet. You can see the rushes and the reeds. Um, uh, indicating that. So this was the biggest uh, excavation of soil but it's also where most of the water's held and you can see even the dragonflies at the moment swinging around all over the place. Um, lots of uh, muddy footprints down here you know from the birds um, and you know this to me it sort of is, is a real a lovely uh, place for everything to to sort of end up. So um, Lots of water being held up to stop water flowing off the farm too quickly. Uh, lots of wildlife mixed in this and actually a lot of satisfaction from our you know, human point of view because it's just a nice place to be. You can hear running water, uh, lots of things to see visually and um, it's just a very relaxing place to be on this farm. We've now got the apiary. And as you can see, there's about a dozen hives behind me here, all actually quite active at the moment. And um, lots of uh, activity around, the few flowering plants that are left uh, and the water, of course. It's a lovely warm day, so they're out and um, they're looking quite healthy uh, at, at this stage. Interesting, I'm just watching there's some bees there that are just being bothered by a wasp. And um, the bees themselves seem to be dealing with the wasp rather unpleasantly for the wasp, I should think, that uh, they're obviously competing for that lovely honey that they've got in those hives. So um, these are, I'm told by the beekeeper, um, very, um, very well provided for by the farm with lots of pollinating 
plants uh, flowering throughout the year. We've got lots of willow early in the spring, um, which is nice, and we've had a lot of uh, flowering plants that we let flower that we don't cut on the farm. So um, even with our lays where the sheep are grazing, we still allow those to fully flower. Uh, we don't top it with a tractor or anything. So all through the year, there are flowering species uh, available, uh, uh, or at least for nearly all of it. Um, and it's a real delight to see the bees. Um, I quite like honey, I, I uh, like a lot of people. Um, and I quite like the idea that they're well provided for with um, lots of food. And they do live here pretty much permanently, so as far as we can tell. We get the odd swarm now and again, you know, moving around the farm, um, but fundamentally they seem to be largely happy. So we've just finished labelling up these trees and um, we started planting them about four years, five years ago now. And um, we put, we've put in 250 different fruit trees here to create a, a heritage orchard. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, most, most uh, fruit would be grown in a sort of monoculture way with a single variety or a, a limited range of varieties. And we wanted as part of our educational remit to show the diversity within British fruit. And so we've created um, a collection uh, with the help of our uh, good neighbours who understand fruit trees and they have the knowledge and the ability to graft uh, to create these trees. We've, we've, we've established a, a, um, a mixture of apples, pears, cherries, plums, uh, and they're all now labelled up. They all tell their own stories. They go back very often a couple of hundred years to their original selectors' names. Um, and they're great stories and I think this will become one of our most interesting resources. Uh, we have all the Oxfordshire apples here, bar two, I think there's 50 different apple uh, uh, varieties and as the years go on the fruit will come, the flowering will come, the sheep will graze underneath these trees, we're clearing them to six foot clear stems so you can imagine these are going to be big trees in the main and as we go through, they're going to be just the most amazing thing to go into. And climbing to pick fruit will be a challenge, but we want to see the trees in all their glory. In the middle of this orchard, there are 50 trees, uh, dwarfed uh, rootstocks, which will mean there's a small area for children to access as a classroom. It's very important that uh, we can all, no matter how big or short we are, can re uh, see the fruit in, in, in it as it grows and develops and, and we can taste it at the right times. Um, and there will be a huge range of when these fruits are ready and what they're used for. Some of them will be eaters, some will be cookers, some will be drinkers and um, everyone will have their own interest, I'm sure, in, in this. Um, and certainly having the bees here, as you can see, uh, surrounding me at the moment, uh, is lovely because they'll pollinate our fruit. And, it, and that's how this farm connects up. It's like a whole ecosystem where each thing leads on to the next. You know, the water, the bees, the pollination, the apiary, the honey, etc. Et